and unelected te technocrats in the United Nations. Hooray! New Zealand has consistently been in the top five economically most free countries for many years. An agreement that seeks to quote, harmonize migration policy with corrupt dictatorships will be disastrous for our country. I could safely speculate that if all nations of the world were to implement this compact, we will not see record-setting waves of migration to Belarus or the Democratic Republic of Congo. <laughs> the PAC supporters say there's no need to be concerned about this agreement because it is non-binding. In that case, why sign a harmless piece of window dressing at all? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. democratic country, governments change, and who can know whether a future government will shrug off this pact as being non-binding or incorporate it as a paramount part of their foreign policy. I will not be part of handing a revolver pointing straight back at me to future governments. Now there are several of the 23 objectives in this agreement that have been drawn up in the usual aspirational, warm, fuzzy, diplomatic language of the UN that do not survive an educated reading between the lines. Objective 15 is called provide access to basic services for migrants. Now currently you have to be a resident or a citizen to access taxpayer funded services from our government. For example, if you're not a resident and you need to use a public hospital, you pay for the service. That is completely reasonable. Now, if you're like me, you welcome immigrants because they will usually take independent initiative to come here for a better life, and they'll use their own resources to make their lives better themselves. Objective 15 tips us on its head giving public health care, all levels of public education and wraparound assistance by the government to access these services. When Michael Joseph Savage implemented Cradle to Grave Welfare State, he would never have imagined that it would become an international welfare system, airport to airport, for any person that shows up on our doorstep. Objective 16 is entitled Empower Migrants and Societies to Realise Full Inclusion and Social Cohesion. We'll have a glance across those details. I'm going to paraphrase because I don't have the attention, uh, I can't hold enough attention to read all this diplomatic language. But we've got promote mutual respect for the cultures, traditions, customs and communities of destination and of migrants, including on ways to promote acceptance of diversity and facilitate social cohesion and inclusion. Next, we've got established comprehensive and needs-based pre-departure and post-arrival programs that may include rights and obligations and basic language training. Now, that's something that I would expect migrants to have already undertaken for themselves if they're planning on moving to a new country to make a better life for themselves. Next, we've got support multicultural activities through sports, music, art, culinary festivals, volunteering, and other social events that will facilitate mutual understanding. Now the Auckland Council through AT and local boards already spent multi-millions of dollars on these activities while failing to provide the basic infrastructure that is essential to the functioning of our city. Council needs to return to the basics instead of increasing funding of UN mandated nice-to-haves. Next, we've got promote school environments that are welcoming and safe. Well, who can argue with that? Incorporating evidence-based information about migration into education curricula and dedicating targeted resources to schools with a high concentration of migrant children for integration activities in order to promote respect for diversity and inclusion and to prevent all forms of discrimination, excluding racism, xenophobia and intolerance. God, that was a mouthful. Well, it's hard to argue against evidence-based information, isn't it? Until you ask the questions about what evidence, whose evidence, the contents of that information, and why does it need to be delivered into our schools? 
Then we get to objective 17, eliminate all forms of discrimination and promote evidence-based public discourse to shape perceptions of migration. This is the biggie. It's full of large words that no decent person could ever publicly oppose for the fear of being labelled a bigot, which is what makes Objective 17 the most dangerous one of all. Here we go with a bit of diplomatic language again. Bear with me, please. Enact, implement or maintain legislation that penalises hate crimes and aggravated hate crimes towards market, uh, migrants. Promote independent, objective and quality reporting of media outlets including internet-based information, including by sensitising and educating media professionals on migration-related issues and terminology, investing in ethical reporting standards and advertising, and stopping allocation of public funding or material support to media outlets that systematically promote intolerance. Brother. Followed up by engaged migrants, political, religious and community leaders, as well as educators and service providers, to Protect and prevent incidents of intolerance, racism, xenophobia, and other forms of discrimination. And getting to it, support activities that promote mutual respect, including in the context of election campaigns. That's the UN effectively sticking their noses straight into our democracy, and that is not acceptable. This goes completely too far. The ACT Party ha is the only parliamentary party to have consistently defended free speech, especially when unpopular speech, which is when it really matters. Whether it be Lauren Southern, Nigel Farage, Don Brash, or the hideous Clementine all men must die Ford, <laughs> free, we have stuck up for every one of them. Free speech is all empowering and no oppressed people in history has ever improved their position without it. Free speech is self-regulating. Whatever good or horrendous thing one person may have to say, everybody else has the, the ability to endorse or condemn it. Free speech is illuminating. Banning the expression of some opinions does not make them go away. It drives them underground where they can fester, building resentment unseen until they eventually explode. The media are a powerful watchdog against government corruption and tyranny. Sometimes they get it wrong. Sometimes they produce tabloid nonsense. Sometimes they take beltway issues you and I couldn't care less about and blow it all out of proportion. But for all the flaws a free press may have, there is no better alternative. Government programs to sensitise media and control messages in electoral campaigns are a hideous proposition. And as a Liberal, I find the very idea that our government still hasn't decided whether to sign up a few days out deeply frightening. If we pass laws preventing hate speech, who is going to regulate that? Who is going to define it? I can tell you the answer to that. The very last people you would ever want to. In Russia, it's Vladimir Putin using hate speech laws to jail gay activists. In Saudi Arabia, it's the medieval religious dictatorship who whips and decapitates atheists. Who will it be in New Zealand? Probably the nasty and stupid regressive left who place fake bombs in theatres with Jewish audiences, make violent threats against venues featuring controversial speakers, and form gauntlets of venomous abuse outside events of which they disapprove. I don't want to hand over power to people like that to regulate how I may think, feel, and speak. Freedom of speech is essential to maintaining a Western liberal democracy. Amen. We do not regulate free speech. We do not compromise free speech. We do not negotiate free speech. And that's why the ACT Party will never support this UN Migration Pact. Thank you very much. Oh. at the oh, UN protest. Oh, hey, Elliot. Hey.
Um, so that was Stephen Berry from the ACT Party at the uh, protest against the UN Migration Pact. Um, haven't done a head cap, we've got well over 100 here, um, probably getting getting up to the 150 near 200s. Um, so that was, we're just waiting a minute for Ali Adekile from the new Conservative Party to come up and give his speech and uh, we'll be recording the, the whole thing. We didn't miss the start of Stephen Berry's speech, um, but I believe someone else got it. All right, we'll go back in, we'll go through the crowd and uh, we'll listen to Elliot's speech. must 
stand together. And look at this beautiful. We've got heaps of yellow vests, hybrid vests. And we are standing in solidarity with our brothers and sisters in France, who the mainstream media also happen to be saying, oh, no, no, they're just whining about taxes. They're not whining about taxes. They're whining about the slow, gradual removal of their way of life, their value systems, the very culture that they fought and died for. The same as us. The same as us. Every single day I remember the sacrifice of our grandparents, our parents, who laid their lives down on the battlefield for us. Fear, blood, hope. We must stand together against the most insidious document that we have. Many of you will know that most of my work has been with at-risk youth, those who have been, who have been raped, those who have had suicidal ideation. What I see going on reminds me very much of what I see when a child is being groomed. I, I believe that we are being groomed to accept this new We have a powerful organization who are whispering sweet nothings in our ear. No, no, no problem. You want some money? Here's some money. Well, I'm sorry. Our funds go to fund our government who is attacking us, and our funds go to fund the UN who is attacking us as well. That's our money. The UN gets their money from governments, the governments get their money from us, from you. That's who it is that we're dealing with right now. And our country's leaders did not even have the decency to come and discuss it with us. Very quiet, very quiet. My last point before I drone on too long is this. First, I'm going to virtue signal. Sorry. <laughs> New Conservative were the first political party to stand up publicly and oppose this pact and oppose everything about it. <laughs> New Conservative were the first to oppose the first hits on free speech when Southern and Molyneux were kicked out. We were the first to publicly stand and bring it to We were not. We were not the first. Little little activity here. Please, just where you are right now, if you could, please just have a look at those people to the left and right around you. Please have a look at the eyes. Oh, he's cute. He's cute. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we were not the first. No political party was the first. The only ones who were the first were you. And it is our absolute privilege. When I said it at the start, privilege, I, I meant it. It was our privilege and our honor to actually stand up for what you had told us about. And so, in my last part, God bless you and God bless this nation of New Zealand. That was Elliot Akile from the New Conservative Party. Uh, we're here at the uh, protest against the UN Migration Pact, uh, the uh, eroding of New Zealand's sovereignty over our own immigration policies, uh, the restriction of, of free speech uh, with the calling in to have hate speech for those who criticize immigration, um, and of course the, the, the overall problem with this pact um, that as an immigrant I could say it's insulting uh, uh, to see people push the idea that uh, nations need to change for the immigrants. No, people who immigrate to other nations need to become more like those nations, right? You move to New Zealand to become more like New Zealand, to live in New Zealand, to make that your, your home, and not to change it to look like the place that you left. Right, so we'll um, go back into the next speech now. the Chinese flag. Not much difference from Australian flag at the moment. <laughs> they flew the Chinese flag on their National Day of Significance because a Chinese ambassador was there, to the exclusion of every other flag. What does that say about this country when one of our territories flies the flag of a foreign, I would say, hostile power? 
and we're doing nothing about it. We talk about open borders. The border is already open. It is already a free for all for all the people that come in. 130,000 people was because Statistics New Zealand realised they were counting the figures wrong. That's the reality of the situation. We talk about illegal immigration. The National Party says this migration pact is bad because it allows for illegal immigration. Ladies and gentlemen, 10,000 overstays in this country because they won't fund Immigration NZ enough resources to send them back. That's the reality. So yes, this is a symbolic victory for the globalists, but don't let it slip your minds what's been going on in this country for the past 10 years. Now for me, it's not about being anti-migrant or anti-immigration. For me, it's about one simple thing. It's about democracy. And what we find about migration policy, and what we find about the UN, is every single time when the most important decisions about how we live our lives come, they never asked us. We were never asked. There was no memo, there were no minutes, we missed the notice for the AGM. Ladies and gentlemen, we were treated as, as if we were asleep, but they took our taxpayer money to do it anyway. But this is where history becomes important. This isn't the first time this has happened. 30 years ago, the national government introduced the bill before parliament the 1991 Immigration Amendment Act and what that did is it unleashed this floodgate of immigration that we now see today. Labour had their part to play as well, by no, by no means am I letting them off the hook. Well what happened there? Well the bill went before Parliament and there were 75 submissions and 73 of those submissions were absolutely unequivocally opposed because of the lack of thinking and foresight in this bill. Two were in favour and those two submissions in favour were both from immigration consultants. How about that? <laughs> How about that? Once again, immigration policy is not the preserve of the people, it's the preserve of the tiny, small, busted away elites living in Wellington, and now because of this migration compact, all the way in Manhattan, New York. And it's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. When you look at the document itself, you're looking, what we're looking for, we're looking for the word democracy. It doesn't feature. We're looking for the word consultation. Consultation appears four times across 38 pages, and every time it appears, it is not talking about consultation with the people. It is not talking about consultation with democracies or through elections. It is talking about consultation through migration advocacy groups or remittance groups to make sure that the migrants' money goes back to where they came from. But nowhere in that document does it talk about, hey, we're going to sign up to these people, to this new agreement. Are we going to ask them about it? Are we going to get their opinion? The most dangerous thing about this compact is not what it says, because it pays lip service to many things. It says we believe in free speech. But at the same time, we want to eliminate racism, xenophobia, and discrimination against all migrants and refugees. The first, the first organisation to achieve that in human history. Well, good luck to them. But in the process, we lose freedom of speech. In the process, in their mad quest for a utopian, perfect society, we lose freedom of expression and we lose freedom of association. It talks about respecting sovereignty, but at the same time, it's promoting regular migration, which is a code word for legal as opposed to irregular, which is coded for illegal. It says it respects the sovereignty of nations, but who is the first to criticise those countries who stand up and say, yes, borders matter? It's the UN, it's the EU, and it's every globalist institution, whether it's the international Catholic networks or whether it's the global investors, every single time. So at once they say, yeah, we're going to let you have a democracy and we're going to let you make your own decisions unless they're the wrong decisions. What happened after the last US election? They said democracy was under attack. No, democracy happened. And sometimes you don't always get the results you want. But that's exactly what this compact is about. It's about insurance. It's about insurance for the globalists because they understand that their establishment and their consensus is breaking. People are waking up. They're starting to realize that all the lies they told them, we need migration for skills. Oh, that's, oh excuse my French. That's nonsense, nonsense. Because <laughs> the fact of the matter is, people coming into this country are not skilled. 60% of the migrants coming here on visas are not on the essential skills list. When you look at the people coming in, hairdressers, restaurant managers, and gas station attendants, tell that to the 79,000 young Kiwis who are not in education, employment, or training. How about that? They said that immigration was going to give us jobs. It was going to give us jobs. We have more migration than ever, but unemployment has never gone down 150,000 in this country since the 1990s. There was a day in this country where we had a job and you were ready to work, we'd give you that job. And then throughout the 80s, it reached 300,000. What happened? The 300,000 Kiwis who built this country into one of the most richest places in the OECD give up and lose their work ever overnight? Is that what happened? Are you serious? Do you really believe this nonsense?
They said that it would grow our economy. But when you look at it today, growth per capita, per hours worked, has never been lower. We're actually doing worse than some countries like Slovenia, Czechoslovakia. We're doing worse and growing worse than countries that have emerged from communism. What does that tell you? What does that tell you about what's going on in this country? If you're going to take away one message from today, it's this. This migration compact is just the beginning and just that. After this comes the conferences and all the airplane rides. After this comes the forums and the conferences. After it comes the working groups and the reviews. What this is about is entrenching the idea of migration as a human right into legislation and into political discourse. I remember as a young person growing up in these schools, and first we told we were a bicultural country. And then I got to high school and we were a multicultural country. Yeah. Once we were diverse, now we're hyper-diverse. Oh, I just, I just can't keep up. I don't know if it's me or if it's them or the speed at which they're going through. But eventually I just woke up and I realized they don't know what they're talking about. They are undermining the idea of what it is to be a New Zealander by making the very name redundant. They are making the idea of nationhood utterly redundant by stripping out of everything that makes it meaningful. We respect sovereignty, but you can't make your own laws. We respect nations, but you can't be proud of who you are. We respect borders unless you enforce them. How about that? <laughs> the key takeaway is this. We have enough trouble with our own domestic politicians, holding them to account for the promises they make to us. In the 1990s, National said there's a deluge of immigrants coming in and we have to stop it. And then they came in and Labour said there's an absolute flood of people coming in and we have to stop it. And it goes back and forth. We have to see past this two-party system that is cheating the people of New Zealand of their sovereignty, of their aspirations and of their opportunities, especially for our young people. At the end of the day, we have enough trouble holding our own politicians to account. Why would we give responsibility for making migration policy to a bunch of unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats living all the way in Manhattan, New York, with their villas in Tuscany and their bank account in the British Virgin Isles? I say policy made by Kiwis, for Kiwis, in the name of Kiwis, and ever and always thinking of Kiwis. Thank you, everybody. decision-making to the authority of a third party international such as the United Nations. Let's be absolutely honest here, this is not about refugees leaving or fleeing from war-torn countries. This is solely about an outright attack on nation-state sovereignty by the United Nations. It's not just New Zealand. So while we're being honest, let's be honest about the uh, track record of the UN. They've never managed to resolve a single conflict in the Middle East or anywhere else in this, in this earth since its inception over 70 years ago. It has an appalling track record when it comes to lifting people out of poverty. People or nations have failed on every count. In fact, it's fair to say that wherever the United Nations has got involved in international affairs, it has failed miserably. The One New Zealand Party formally rejects the United Global Compact for Migration and we make public our strong opposition to any of the coalition government members signing such a document on our behalf. Our Deputy Prime Minister Winston Peters and Labour's Ian Lees Galloway has slunk off to Morocco to sign this document. 
without so much as any form of uh, public consultation. And the parties being New Zealand First and the Greens, they're just leading them. In fact, they are complicit by their lack of a voice on this uh, subject. And they are enabling Labour to not with, by not withdrawing their support publicly. And believe me, National is not much better. In fact, it was National's leader, John Key, that signed and adopted the UN New York Declaration for Refugees and Migrants just two years ago in 2016. So, the UN Global Compact for Migration is an expansion of the United Nations 2030 Agenda, which again is, a, is an expansion of the 2021 20, Agenda. It's also a substantial for the uh, sustainable development and the Addis Ababa Action Agenda. So this is not a new thing. This is actually the fifth stage in a six-stage process for the United Nations. And the result will be borderless countries. So this, this particular pact has been designed to protect the lives of migrants. And it has come about mainly because of the number of migrants that have migrated illegally en masse to Europe in the last five years. So it, it demands that every UN state, including New Zealand, opens their borders and not only makes it even easier for illegal migrants and refugees to enter our countries, but also for us as New Zealand taxpayers to fund their, their legal defence to then stay here. The US is demanding that all member states actually assist these people to illegally enter our countries. To give these illegal immigrants, well actually the term is actually now irregular, illegal is a little bit too harsh. So it actually gives these irregular migrants assistance to find work, integrate into the New Zealand populace, and oh yes that's right, for the New Zealand citizens to understand these irregular migrants cultures religions and languages. It doesn't say anything about helping them to become New Zealanders. The UN are effectively uh, endangering the lives of these uh, migrant people by inviting irregular and illegal refugees and migrants to undertake treacherous journeys and making it the responsibility of the destination country to actually make and keep those migrants safe. The UN is also inadvertently putting children at risk by, by actually promoting illegal migration channels for these children. Because then it becomes yours and my, as New Zealand citizens, responsibility to rep repatriate and reunite these families here in New Zealand. The United, Global, the United Nations Global Compact for Migration claims to promote the protection of human rights, yet there are some cultures that do not want to coexist peacefully in, free, in a free manner in any country. The cultures they know are ones of violent religious tyranny. In recent years, NATO US lead interventions such as the UN sanctioned 2011 Regime Change Initiative in Libya have rather than help, in fact, furthered the spread of ISIS and jihadism into those countries, thereby exacerbating not only the refugee problem, but also the anti-West sentiment of those refugees. Some of these people bring that tyranny and violence into the countries they illegally migrate to. And the UN had completely disregarded the, the rights, the health, the safety of the people in those destination countries, in Europe and in UK in particular. And to think that it cannot happen here, it's not just naive, it's actually stupid and dangerous thinking. One of the UN's... Uh, clauses and the commitment from the New York Declaration was to, and I quote, support those countries rescuing, receiving and hosting large nations of refugees and migrants. 
Well, we've seen how well that works in Europe and the UK and Italy and all those other countries, haven't we? So the One New Zealand Party demands that the New Zealand Government do not sign the UN Global Compact for Migration. Member states the categories. One is a nation of origin. One is a nation of transit. And one is a nation of destination. So which countries are not signing these, this pact? We've got the USA, we've got Australia, Israel, Hungary, Austria, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Switzerland, Croatia, Latvia, Italy, Bulgaria and Belgium. All of these countries who are not signing this document, funnily enough, fall into the country of destination category. All of those countries that fall into the origin, uh, the category of the country of origin, they're all for it. They're the ones that are queuing up to sign it. So my last point is that the job of our elected representatives in government is to look after our best interests and keep the citizens of New Zealand safe. Peters and Lee and Lee's Galloways, by signing this document on behalf of the coalition government, is nothing short of an act of treason. And I sincerely hope that voters remember this in the upcoming elections. Thank you. Just a reminder, I did mention it before, um, if you think you can't be got at, um, think again. Um, you might be aware that Carol here has started the petition. Anybody keep sharing it, because she has been shut down. Somebody down there has got in, into Facebook, and she has, she has banned till, I think, 9.15 on Monday. She hasn't um, posted anything controversial. All she did was post um, public knowledge stuff on the parliamentary website, and they've deemed it as being what, they, what they call it, Carol? Breaking Facebook community standards. <laughs> How the hell is pasting, you know, that be breaking community standards? Someone's being a rat bag. Yeah, I'm pretty loud. Um, yeah, how the hell is that? breaking community standards. Now this will happen to everybody, so it's essential that we actually keep posting um, and spread it. They can't, they can't ban us all. Hi everyone. I've been shut down. Barry Soper said that I was a threat. So I'm just a little old me. Why would I be a threat? The wicked witch of the West. <laughs> but I tell you, you people are all doing a good job signing that petition. I just want you to keep on sharing, sharing, sharing. Talk to your neighbours, talk to your friends. Just keep on sharing. I think the people of New Zealand have got a false sense of security. They think because we haven't got land borders, then, you know, we're really safe, but we're not. UK hasn't got land borders. Look at them. I know they're in Europe. But look at Australia, what's happening there. Okay. Believe me, we are not safe. We're not safe at all. So we need to all do our bit and encourage everyone to come on board. And because I can't post until this thing is signed, <laughs> next Tuesday, I need you all to do the work for me. So thank you very much, everyone. You've been great. Oh, can you hear the, uh, the last speaker there was uh, was Carol. She's the one who initiated the petition, the parliamentary petition against the uh, migration pact, um, and we've actually shared that on Right Minds. Um, and just found out that she's been banned from Facebook for violating community standards in sharing uh, a petition against the or starting the petition against the UN migration pact. Um, and she's banned until about midnight on Monday. Uh, which is when the uh, pact is due to be signed. So that's a very, very convenient ban. And of course, it's no surprise to see that uh, opposing UN migration is against the Facebook community standards. I think we've got one more speech, so I'll go back in and uh, we'll go listen to that. One lot start the problem and the other lot pretend they're fixing it and they pass it on. And this particular one is a product of all of them down there, unfortunately. They're all involved in it. So now we know um, uh, the behaviour and the thinking and the outcome. So we're, we, we all treasure your, your email contacts and send you information to help keep this thing moving forward. We want to educate but also to organise. 
And organising means people who want to do something taking an initiative and will resource and support you. We put out the flyers today, provide the speakers and welcome um, the leader from Gisborne. Where are you, Richard? Richard. Ah, Richard Whiteley, he was the, the gentleman who at short notice brought this thing to court. I'd like you to give a round of applause for him and the team who came from. Oh, thank you very much, Richard. It's a long way. Yes. Oh, there's an announcement coming through. Hold on. Is it from you, Jules? Here we go. Hi everyone, I was just talking to Carol and she's done an amazing job, but it's just an idea that I wanted to suggest. Um, someone, haven't quite decided who, but someone in our little group will crowd, put up a crowdfunding uh, for a full page in the Herald, okay, on the, on the compact. A full page on Saturday is 20 grand, the Sunday Herald is about 10. So please keep that in mind and keep an eye out on the crowdfunding page. I can't remember the, the, the log on, but you, you can um, score that. It will be up there. Please dig deep into your pockets. If we can get this out, uh, the Herald apparently, well, I was talking to someone a few days ago, said it is, you know, they can't really stop it. It's legal. There's nothing illegal about it. So please bear that in mind. And if we all contribute just a little bit, we can get this out to the whole of New Zealand. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. That was quick activism right there. Right on, good on it. Good on it. So, uh, so just uh, you're wondering, speak to the truth. We're here every fortnight on Saturdays, speaking and practicing free speech because it's one of those things that if you don't exercise it and use it, it just fades away as a memory. And so as practitioners of free speech, we're so grateful to, to you all for coming. You might have noticed that all the speakers had free access to communicate and all we need to do is keep this ball rolling. The UN Global is a, is, a, is a focus issue but there are others which are connected with it and you're probably aware of that. So uh, I would think it's now time for us to wrap it up unless there are any more announcements coming through. What's that, ma'am? Yes. Yes. Oh. Yeah, this lady saying, keep pressure on the MPs. I called Vincent Peter's office yesterday and they were very interested. Okay, that's um, the end of the, uh, the speeches. Uh, very nice. Uh, we had, uh, I think, three, three different political parties represented there, uh, perhaps more in the audience. Um, and keep the pressure on, um, keep signing those, those petitions, uh, contact your MPs, uh, send them emails, send them letters, and um, you know, we have a couple of days left before this is due to be signed, and uh, there's still, still an opportunity to make sure it doesn't, uh, doesn't get signed. Of course, either way, uh, this is only the beginning, if they pass it, or if we uh, hold them back, it's just one, one step, and of course they'll try again, so we must remain uh, we must remain vigilant, and that's the end of, uh, of this live stream. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day, and until next time.